Nice to be with you all tonight. I am, um, I have just have a couple announcements and then we'll meditate. So Eve and I chit chatted a little bit uh, over text today to make our plan for the next few classes because we're nearing the end. As you know, we have just two more slogans to do before we complete our 59 slogans. So I'll do one tonight, number 58. And then next week we'll come on together and we'll teach uh, the last one. We'll kind of have a, a final class with the slogan marathon that we've had for over a year, I think. We started in August last year. And so then what we'll do is after next week, the following, so, and also next week is full moon. So we'll do something special. We'll celebrate. Maybe we'll do some chanting. Maybe I'll fix, get the harmonium at least a little bit workable and we'll chant or something fun. Yeah. And then um, the 27th, I will teach, I'll guide feeding your demons, which I haven't done in a while. And I like to do that every once in a while. So I'll do that as kind of a in-between buffer between our themes so the 27th, we'll do Feeding Your Demons, Invite Your Friends. Hey, fun Wednesday night, come feed your demons. And um, then November 3rd, we will start our new book study on the path to enlightenment by Matthew Ricard. He edited this wonderful book, a compilation of beautiful quotes and teachings that take us through the whole path from beginning to end. And so uh, from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, it's another form of lojong, of mind training, actually. So I hope you join us and invite your friends. And we'll see, we'll do that for as long as we do that. You know, each night we'll maybe read a passage or two from the theme. You know, we'll decide as we go along. It's not like a storybook or like a teaching book or anything like Opening the Heart, I think is what we did with Sokni Rinpoche. It's not that kind of book. It's like the book has chapters and then many passages um, that elucidate the theme in that chapter. So maybe the chapter will be Bodhicitta and some of the most beautiful passages that Matthew Ricard found he put in there or Nature of Mind, you know, and then the whole chapter will be about that. It's just fabulous. And so get the tangible book, if you can, on the path to enlightenment. I used to have it right next to me, but it's in the other room. On the Path to Enlightenment by Matthew Ricard, I-R-C-A-R-D. On the Path to Enlightenment. And the audio book for that book is fabulous. The, the man who reads it has a great voice, great uh, del delivery. So I got the audio book a few years ago and just loop it on road trips, puts me to sleep at night, traveling. It's a great, great, one of those classic audio books to have that you can listen to over and over again. Okay, so that's it for now. Let's go ahead and settle in and get comfortable. We're going to do Tonglen tonight. We'll sit for about a half an hour. We'll start with some mindfulness of the breath to settle in, and then I'll guide you through the stages of the classic four steps of the Tonglen practice. So either upright or supine, pick your pick. And most important thing is to be comfortable, feel at ease at the end of your day so that you can drop in and enjoy the nourishment of the meditation. Let's start with the eyes closed and a nice straight spine whether you're upright or on the floor or your bed. Make sure that the nose is aligned with the belly button, nice and straight, a natural S-curve through the back. And feel your breath start to deepen now. Feel the belly relax and receive the breath. Feel the whole belt line soften, even loosen the, the pants or the belt around your waist so that the breath can be relaxed and full. <clears throat> Kidneys soft, receiving the nourishment of the breath, the adrenals.
And then notice your face and notice if there's any tension, breathing in and breathing out, releasing any tension held in the face, behind the eyes, the brow, the jaw. Feel the chin draw slightly in towards the center of the throat. And feel that length in the back of the neck. And feel as if you could breathe into the base of the skull, the occiput, the brainstem. Kind of open those spaces between the sutures of the skull. And feel that relaxation kind of drain down through the shoulders, the, through the spine, paraspinal muscles, all the way down, the base of the back, the sacrum. And as you breathe, feel the communication between the cranial sacral pair, the rhythm, the base of the cranium, the occiput, and the sacrum. There's not a real perceptible outward movement, but within the body, there's a movement of the spinal fluid as you breathe, as you move, as the breath expands and releases. Feel that relaxation melting down through the hips, the buttocks, the legs, all the way through the knees, shins, and the feet. Likewise, the arms into the hands. Palms can be face down on the thighs or palms up if you're lying down by your side. Bring the tip of the tongue to rest at the upper palate. Slacken the jaw. And just gently become aware of the in and the outflow of the breath. And let the breath invigorate your bodhicitta, your personal heartfelt prayer. Of prayer to be of benefit through your practice. And with the body relaxed, the breath natural, as natural as possible. Let the mind, the attention, alight upon the in and the outflow of the breath as it enters in and travels down into the lungs, expanding the belly and so on, exhaling, leaving the body. Just feel the full cycle of the sensory input as you breathe in and out and let that ground your awareness in your body and we'll take about 21 breaths if you like you can count at the top of each breath or just breathe until i signal that we shift into tonglen Releasing distraction with the out-breath, the familiar commentaries. Get more interested in the sensations of the breath in the body.
Now we'll venture into the hallmark practice of the Lojong teachings, which is sending and receiving Dong Len. With the Dong, which is the sending, we breathe out that which is positive and healing. And with the Len, the receiving, we breathe in that which we would normally push away. We would normally judge as not good or not healing. So we're really learning to be alchemists here. And in order to do Tonglen in a wholesome, effective way, first we need to remember and flash on the bodhicitta, the wisdom heart, the immutable, indestructible, vajra-like nature of mind at the heart center. So let's take some time here just to breathe, uh, drawing in, drawing out directly from the heart space as if you could breathe a full 360 degrees. And with each breath, you're aerating, opening, remembering that bodhicitta heart of love, light, compassion, wisdom at your heart chakra, the heart center like an orb of light, like the sun contained within your sternum, the size of, a, of an orange or so. Oxygenating that within you, igniting it within you, and let that wisdom permeate your whole being. Remembering this is actually more of who you are than your fear and your insecurities, limitations. This is your essence. This flash on openness, the flash on bodhicitta is the first step in the Tonglen. And from that basis, all else follows. So now let's do the Tonglen with ourself, first step. Maintaining this feeling of the breath drawing into the heart space, the outbreath breath traveling out from the heart space. And just scan your body-mind matrix and feel if there's any little feeling of stuckness or resistance or fear or block, or residual anxiety or sadness, heartbreak. Feel it as energy. And with the in-breath, feel like you're vacuuming it up or you're drawing it into that luminous orb of light at your heart. It's embraced. It's welcomed home transformed into light and then exhale breathing out a release of resistance of struggle an integration of that raw energy perhaps even the remedy if you feel that you can touch in on that for example if i'm working with my frustration or anger breathe that into my heart welcome it home and breathe out the transformed anger, which could be patience or space or love, whatever feels right to you. And let that permeate your body. Offer it, make an offering to yourself. Let this be intuitive. We'll spend about 20 breaths here. I'll keep the pace. You don't need to count, but just take your space here. Work with anything that's in your field. drawing in that which you would normally push away. You're working with yourself, not others. First step, work with yourself.
And now the next phase of Tonglen, once you've nourished and attended to your own inner tapestry and you feel ready, you can shift to work with a loved one, friend, family member, sibling, child, parent, lover, someone towards whom it's quite easy for you to feel affection toward. And now we start to visualize in front of us this person, just start with one so you can be specific and really have a focused attention and not get too dispersed. No, just there might be a few in your field that you'd like to work with, maybe somebody who's suffering or alone or experiencing hardship in some way, health wise, emotionally. Picture them as clearly as you can in front of you. It's helpful to think of seeing them the way that you saw them last. What were they wearing? What did they look like? See them in front of you as clearly as you can, even feeling like you can see into their eyes. Look at their eyes, their face, their expression, their mood. The instruction is to see whatever hardship they might be carrying internally, psychically, spiritually, emotionally in them, like a dark, smoky vapor surrounding them, like a cloud. And with this power of your breath, the len and the tong, the tong and the len, you draw in directly into the heart space where their hardship, their suffering, their confusion in the form of the smoky vapor draws into the luminous orb of light at your heart, you transform it and breathe out a cool healing light of release, of acceptance, of whatever remedy intuitively feels right to you. You're not trying to fix them. It's not a control. This is an offering from care and compassion. Whatever would be good for them, you offer with the out-breath, See that clearing, that smoky vapor, like a cool breeze, and continue like this with each breath, drawing in the smoke, offering out the cool, clear wind, light, whatever feels right for you. You can even make a prayer, you know, breathing in. May you be free of suffering. Breathing out, may you feel joy. May you be happy. Whatever personal prayer comes to you, offer it with a breath. We'll spend some time here. And over the course of the next few breaths, see any hardship they have fully clearing and see them come to their full flourishing. Sparkle in their eyes, smile on their face, healthy, happy, whatever comes to you. Really see that for them.
And now shifting, dissolving that visualization. And shifting now to so-called neutral person. This is very interesting. Someone you may see in your neighborhood or at the market, male person, even a, maybe even a personality on TV, somebody towards whom you're not that strongly drawn towards or averse to. Really see if you can find someone as neutral as possible, just kind of most of the population. Now, you may not be completely neutral towards anyone, that's okay. Just choose someone. See them as clearly as you can in front of you. Last time they, they appeared to you, notice their expression, the look in their eyes, what they're wearing. See them as clearly as you can in front of you, in your mind's eye. And often we intuit people might be carrying some hardship, stress, strain in their life. You don't have to know what it is. Just whatever they might be carrying. Notice it as a smoky cloud around them. And continue with the breath, the same rhythm, same technique. With each breath, that energy clears. They become lighter, brighter. Feel free to say a prayer if that helps you stay focused. This is like a shamatha practice. Release distraction and stay with the breath and the process. Over the next few breaths, see their energy clearing and healing and sparkle in their eye, buoyancy in and around them. And then mindfully just acknowledging this and moving now, dissolving this visualization and shifting now into so-called challenging person in your life. This is where it gets a little more juicy. Someone towards whom you might not normally wish good upon or even offer to take on their suffering but like you, even our so-called enemies wish to be happy and free of suffering. 
In that we share humanity with everyone. Perhaps these people that we find challenging in our life are just completely confused about how to create happy circumstances. Instead, they sow the seeds of suffering in themselves and others around them. In the Tibetan teachings, they say, oh, compassion for those people, just sowing the seeds of future negative karma. Elicit that feeling of compassion for even, even the most so-called evil people. Because of those negative karmic future seeds they're sowing and the harm they're doing for others. So bring someone to mind. It can be someone you know or someone you know of who challenges you, who presses your buttons or has hurt you in some way. This is the enemy category. And you might not have enemies, you know. You might have just people who irritate you. You can work with them. Choose one person. Really land on that one person for now. See them as clearly as you can in front of you. How did they look the last time you saw them? What were they wearing? The look in their eyes. And see, feel, sense that their suffering is surrounding them like a cloud. And again, the in-breath draws that in. And you have the courage of the bodhisattvas who at least visualize, at least with prayer, feel what it would be like to be willing to breathe in their suffering, transform it at that indestructible orb of light at your heart, your bodhicitta. And then with the out-breath, offer healing, resolution, clarity, and blowing that smoke away with each out-breath. Really stay with this. The mind's going to want to escape here. That's okay, but hold it and stay and really feel what this feels like for you. Not thinking it, but feeling it. Their hardship isn't poisoning you. It can't hurt you because your heart, that light at your heart is indestructible. The undying, diamond-like nature of your own luminous mind, your Buddha nature. Hold the view and stay with the breath and feel how this work changes you. We're not changing the other. Feel. Stay with it. You may even begin to feel that you are released from the shackles of your anger, resentment, resistance. Notice the liberatory feeling that comes from releasing the struggle, the projection, the hatred, judgment.
And with the next few breaths, see their disposition completely lightening, brightening, healing of their hardship, their confusion, and suffering. Sparkle in their eyes, smile on their face, a lightness of being pervades them. If you wish, take your hand, one of your hands, and put it on your heart and just remember that you're still here, that you're okay. You haven't given too much of yourself. You've actually invigorated your capacity to be a fully alive human being engaged in this world. You won't be shut down by the world. A bodhicitta heart, heart beats so strongly within you and all of us. Compassionate heart. Even if it was challenging for you, that's okay. And now as a reward, we get to float all the way up from light, being uh, weightless up to the moon now. Imagine yourself sitting on the moon, gazing down at this beautiful planet of ours, and Donglen for the world, there's this broader scope of breathing in the global hardship, transforming it at that heroic bodhicitta heart within you that boundless strength and breathing out the healing like a cool wind, clearing the pollution, the violence, the war, the suffering, the harm. Breathe it in, transform it, and breathe out healing. Offer that to this world. The people on it, the animals, the insects, the being seen and unseen, and the world itself, the elements, the spirits. And like before, over the course of the next few breaths, really see the world healed, specific groups, people, free of harm and fear. Just make that prayer, feel that, envision it.
And now let's just let go, let go of everything, the mental effort, the visualization, any control you might have had with the breath. And just rest in the natural state, free of doing, free of concepts, just rest, just let go. The eyes open or closed as you wish for a few moments. And we'll close our meditation just like we opened with a prayer of dedication uh, inspired by bodhicitta. Any positive energy of our practice together may it ben bring benefit beyond what can be seen, like the waves of blessings rippling out in all directions we offer this positive merit or energy for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Emaho, how wonderful this Tibetan expression of wonder. Emaho, how wonderful. So we'll close and come back. You know, in, in the Tibetan language, the word for blessings actually means blessing waves. Jin is blessing, lup is waves. And that's the feeling that we do when we dedicate is blessing waves in all directions. <laughs> so feel free to chat in or unmute and ask a question. I'd love to see who's here and hear your voice or see your chat. If you feel that you can even want to engage in the computer. You don't have to, of course. You can just listen. Denise, good. Yeah. It's, uh, Leanne has raised her hand. Go ahead, Leanne. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I kind of clamped down on the security settings because somebody unmuted themselves by mistake. Now people can unmute themselves. Okay. Try again. Okay. Hi. I can't get my video on still, but if that's okay, it's pretty dark here anyway. I mean, like the, your permission setting won't let me is what I'm oh. saying, but it, it, does, it just is fine. I'm changing um, that now too. <laughs> yeah. um, you just can't share your screen, okay? <laughs> All um, right, go ahead. Now I see you a little bit. I know it's really dark anyway. I, I set mood lighting for Tonglen, you know? Fabulous. Yes. Um, it was a very, I, it, I felt in a way I hadn't before that it was a very empowering practice and it sort of really made me understand prayer in a new way be, and exactly what you were saying that it's these, um, ripples of blessing waves, mm. um, yeah. that whereas otherwise I feel powerless to, you know, do to fix the suffering of the world or you know um or someone else's suffering or my own yeah it felt like suddenly I had all this agency and at a couple points I was like oh wait wait, wait don't forget the love part because it I like I really felt it more in like a solar plexus kind of way than a heart chakra way mm, right. that's okay yeah yeah, both. Then you have the three center, you know, the belly center, the heart center, and then the head center comes online. But we do that sometimes. And those, it's nice to be activated in multiple places. Yeah, yeah so it felt very empowering in a way that uh, was helpful. Good. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah, empowering, not depleting. You know, sometimes people, when they're 
maybe you're familiar, you know, I don't know how much you've done with the Tonglen per se, but um, sometimes in the beginning, people are like, oh, I can't do that. You know, <laughs> it's going to deplete me. Um, but if the, if the setting is done right, you know, if the view is, is set up and people really feel that they understand the basis of what we're doing and how it can be done in a way that's not depleting, it, it is empowering and, yeah, liberating. Anyone else? Oh, I see Leanne's full question about the book. You know, you don't need to get a tangible book. If you have the audio book, and that's totally enough. You know, we'll read the passages. Uh, we'll talk about the passages. But um, you did, nobody needs to get anything, actually, if they don't want to. And still come. Slogan's pretty easy tonight. Not a lot of content with the slogan, so bring it on. Meditation questions, if you have. And all questions are good. Yes, Lindsay. Question. Hi. Hi. Um, can you talk through again um, when you are practicing for someone who's difficult? And I notice, like, you know, what comes up for me, depending on who I'm working with. Um, I'm really aware of the energy in my body. That's like, you know, that I'm trying to counteract. And um, it's like the layers of awareness there. I'm like, no, no, don't get mad at yourself because you're having those feelings. Just let them be. But I'm wondering, it feels um, a bit like then I get locked into kind of like a managerial struggle with myself where like <laughs> I'm trying to manage my own Tonglen practice and do it in a way that like maximizes um, or, or drowns out or minimizes like the, the feelings of err. I don't really like you. So I'm wondering if you could just talk through that part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes you do kind of have to think yourself through it a little bit, talk yourself into it because it's can be counterintuitive and you know, for me, the Tonglen for the enemy really started working when I was at rock bottom with that person, um, where I, I just had nowhere else to go. And I was exhausted by the struggle. So there, it, there is a bit of a bootstrapping through it in a, a way in the beginning, and then, then usually the breakthroughs come. And... Um, but also a sense of light touch towards yourself and, and when you're feeling like, okay, I'm doing this for them, but I'm still, I don't like them. I don't want to do it from, for what's helped for me. I guess that's what I can really offer you is just the recognition that that is making me sick. You know, it makes, it's toxic. It, it's not working. Um, it's, it's the knee jerk reaction. It's the obvious reaction, you know, let's get a little bit more nuanced and creative and maybe even intelligent about the way we work with this person and my feelings about this person. Cause I'm sick of eddying in the struggle, the anger, resentment, whatever it is. Right. So in a way, you kind of do have to like psych yourself up for it, but not in a fake way, but like really have a talking with yourself like, okay, my anger towards them hasn't really gotten me anywhere. Because you, this isn't about changing them, Lindsay, you know, I mean, maybe sometimes that's also I'm not saying that's what I'm just using your question as an opportunity to give a broader teaching. Okay. Sometimes people think, get, get frustrated with this because they think it's about changing that person, right? But it's, it's really not. It's about changing the energy field between you and that person. It's about changing your own 
energy towards that person, emotional thrust about them, story around them. And digging beneath the surface, like, like I said, you asked me to walk you through it again. Well, the first, the first phrase that is classic Tonglen, I'm not making this up. It's not new age. <laughs> it's not Chandra age. It is recognize that just like you, that person who's caused you so much harm wants to be free of suffering and find happiness. But it's just that they're confused about how to do it, right? They're creating more harm and sowing more seeds for future suffering. So when we understand that, we can even look at the, the worst politicians, the people we want, we love to hate, and have that, oh, ningje, you know, the Tibetan phrase, oh, compassion. For the worst evildoers, because they're going to freaking suffer in the hell realms or the next life, and they're probably already suffering in their mental state. So if you don't believe in reincarnation, don't worry, it doesn't matter. But you know, what Buddhists talk about reincarnation, and it's in a way it's, it, it's, it props up and it supports a lot of the practices, because it's like you believe if you understand karma, you understand that if I that these people, if they're doing bad things, they're just sowing the seeds of their own suffering too. They're going to suffer, it'll come back to them. Ningje, oh, compassion. Okay, so from that basis of shared humanity, then we can get below the dynamic, the surface dynamic, and then start to, to authentically understand why I would want to do Tonglen for that person. I don't want them to be angry and cause havoc in my life or everybody else's life. So let's wish them well. Let's help relieve the, the suffering their delusion that makes them act in that way. So it does take some finessing and some rationalizing, a little getting around the, the resistance patterns that we have. Thank you for that. Ed, I think one of my struggles just in general in meditation is um, that I can be hyper analytical and um, it's it's like a hard line for me to decide what is like sort of good bootstrapping as you said or discipline mm -hmm. versus managing to do it right and defeating the purpose of the practice at all so i think that's something i just kind of i'm trying to navigate but it was really helpful when mm -hmm. you said um when you were talking about you know this is doing this for us it was definitely helpful to refocus yeah my feelings versus finding the ways that i do subtly say you know there is some part often of me um thinking i'm doing tongue lin for you so that you won't be so fucked up <laughs> right like and it, it it's totally from a place of like judgment and superiority so yeah, um, don't. Yeah, we yeah. have to be careful with that. So yeah. you named it, and you recognize that you can come at it that way. And now you know, you yeah. know, you know, you do know that that's actually n not what what Tonglen is asking us to do. So that's an important step. So people get confused about that, and they forget, and then they think, "Oh, well, why am I trying to manipulate? Isn't it manipulative? You know, <laughs> controlling." It's very much like feeding your demons, actually. You know, I mean, we have to work with our own reaction to the world. But really what you're doing is you're working with your own reaction to that person. You're developing your own capacity to be more compassionate and understanding. And I swear to God, I mean, I've heard stories. I have my own stories. Things change. And you don't even know how or why. The rational mind can't even really make sense of it. But when you start releasing the struggle, you know, then um, the energy around you changes, the people change, the dynamic changes. It is beyond rational explanation, but it happens. It can happen. Okay, I see a note here from Lucy. I just wanted to say how I couldn't help but smile when you said our hearts our inner orb of light is like an orange. I know <laughs> I actually had a moment there too, but it is, they say like a grapefruit or an orange. <laughs> Humor is good though, isn't it? Humor every once in a while is 
good little dose. But yeah, that's who else giggled when I said like an orange. <laughs> Brendan did. Now you won't forget it. I said like an orange and then like, God, would an orange fit in my chest? <laughs> I don't know what you I've also heard grapefruit. I definitely don't think a grapefruit would fit in my chest. <laughs> Maybe a barrel chest. I got the moon piece from Pema Children. I've shared that before in the past, and I love that. I love that. She taught that at Tara Mandala. She was giving a teaching. She's like, I don't want to teach. I just want to take Q&A. And so I raised my hand. I said, would you guide us in just a even just a brief Tonglen, because you're here live, you're like the t Tonglen, you know, guru, and I've never received it directly from you, would you teach it? So she, and she guided that, she took us right to the moon. <laughs> no stages, not much preamble, dropped us right in the deep end, it's beautiful. Okay, well, you mentioned reincarnation and karma. What's your take on the Brahmanic interpretation that those who are suffering, oh, who are oppressed are getting what they deserve? I don't, I don't buy into that. I don't, I know it's complicated, but I, I, um, I feel that that's a really touchy situation and I think it's a danger zone to believe in uh, people who are suffering are suffering because they deserve it. Uh, I think that we have to be very careful about that. Um, the, we suffer because of all sorts of different reasons. All of us do. Um, you know, but when I lived in India in Tibetan refugee settlement, living amongst Tibetan, studying with lamas, studying with uh, language teachers and when they would reflect on why they lost their country to the Chinese communist government invasion they said it because in the past they had sowed negative seeds they had been a warring people they had invaded China they saw it as a fruition of some past karma I didn't judge them. I didn't say that. I wouldn't be the one to say that. And I would never say that about anyone. Someone once asked the Dalai Lama about a question like this, saying, you know, how, why, how can people say that if a, like a child is abused by an adult, that it's their karma? And the Dalai Lama said, that's not what we mean by karma, you know. Like, how do you know it's not your karma to help save, that, help that person out of that situation? Like, people aren't damned to suffering and work out their situ, like, be stuck in their situation because of some karmic law. So, even even the Buddha said, "I can't explain completely the karmic web. It is so vast." It's not just one cause and result. It's like a, a mandala, a web, four, five, six dimensional, <laughs> ten dimensional web that even I, the Buddha, who's seen the past, seen the future, seen my life, seen, you know, interdependence, cannot explain why a karmic event necessarily came into being. Can't predict what, exactly what your next moment will be because there's so many confluences of karmas. Uh, Laura. Um, I was visualizing, in my case, a, a relative who has gone down the rabbit hole of, you know, Trumpism and all of that and has made me want to scream. Um, and I find myself um, really struggling with not just her, but the folks in our nation right now who, who scare me, they scare me, they're very violent and they scare me. And like, while I can sort of on some level do Tonglen for a moment, 
and see this person as human, as soon as I pull back into the world, mm. it's a very hard place to maintain right now. I'm feeling, it just feels like there's a lot of violence right now floating yeah. around. It's just, you know, kind of coming at me from all sides a little bit. And I'm really finding it hard to maintain that place, even though I did feel it and I could feel compassion for her and her suffering, which knowing enough about her, I know is quite deep and complex and has resulted in her behavior. But it's, I still can't <laughs> deal sometimes, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the question really is like, you know, about taking it off the cushion, you know, it just seems really hard to do that. Yeah, that's the hardest. That's the test. Thank you. Good question, too. All good questions. Um, Lama Tsultra, my teacher, says you can't have post-meditative state without the meditative state. You know, you've got to do AOC, which is ass on cushion. <laughs> you know, a little bit every day to really cultivate the qualities that you want to bring into your life. And then to have the muscle strength, right? The memory strength, the capacities to apply it when the rubber hits the road and in real life when we're really challenged. So it takes time, you know, be patient with yourself. See if you maybe just commit to working Tonglen for this particular person or people uh, five, 10 minutes every day frequency trumps duration a little bit every day is the best way they have found in studies to learn any new skill whether it's a language or art or music or donglen whatever meditation five minutes a day is better than like an hour or two on the weekend right so a little bit and then you'll start to get get the habit of when you feel that feeling about her oh here's an opportunity to practice donglen and you'll get excited about, oh, I'm going to imagine breathing in, even if you're in your car at a red light and you're thinking of her, I'm going to breathe in her confusion, delusion into my heart, transform it at that orange, and then breathe out, cool, clear, wisdom, whatever it is, you know, offer it to her. Not like you should be wise, but like, you know, like really sincerely offer her some, a better state of mind, something better. That, yeah, in your opinion, better, but that's okay. <laughs> we're never going to get away from our subjective opinions as long as we're in a body. So, um, okay, so then this reminds me of a funny story I've told a couple times over the years in this class, but I'm going to tell it again because it was so um, instructive for me. <laughs> this was during the 2016 election between Trump and Clinton. And I was driving to the city. I think I was on golf going up. I was going somewhere. Oh, yeah, I was driving the city to do a class and then come and teach later on in the evening. It, it was against the stream then. And um, we were full on in the middle of the election. And I'm in the city. And in front of me at the stoplight is this big old funky truck with a American flag and a bumper sticker that says, lock her up. <laughs> and now setting the context all day, I've been thinking about class tonight. I'm going to teach on Tonglen and compassion. <laughs> so I'm kind of been thinking, I always think in the car as I'm driving to the city about class, what I'm going to say, what, what I want to do. So, but then I'm behind this guy in the truck with this locker up sticker and the American flag. And I got so angry, like the kind of road rage where I felt like I could kill him. And I'm like, I'm going to drive up next to him. And I'm going to flick him off. You know, like, I got, like really angry. I was so angry. It's like feminist angry. You know? <laughs> and, um, and I had this moment of like, Oh my God, look at you. Look at you, you Tonglen teacher, you. And, and so then I was like, oh, okay, well, let's try it. Let's, okay, let's take this energy because it was big and Tonglen it. Like, okay, what would it be like to breathe out? You know, like breathe in his, 
his whatever I perceive him to be and then breathe out <sighs> space healing clarity wisdom you know like but I'm working with my resistance I'm working with my reaction to him I'm breathing it in and out so instead I started practicing Tonglen form and it was very funny I was laughing to myself in the car because it's like okay you're all of it you know we're all, we have all of these feelings but you know the practice is working on you if you can in the moment think oh yeah Tonglen here's a chance to practice Tonglen I talk about the red light somebody or you know like waiting at the red light sometimes I'd be impatient somebody it's already green and somebody's walking slow or traffic all of that is a great opportunity to practice Tonglen like your whole life should be an opportunity for Tonglen then it will really start to transform your mind and your capacity to work with those challenging persons will get even um even greater and you'll be a happier person why because you'll feel better about yourself you know like i've got something special going on you know you know you i'm in the coffee shop impatient with the slow order in front of me but instead now i get to practice tonglen feel my feet on the floor breathe and nobody has to know that i've got something special happening right now you know <laughs> you know it's like you're an undercover Tonglen practitioner. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely, I mean, I can relate to the road rage and all that. And um, yeah, those are moments when something needs to be done to stop my. Yeah. yeah. And same with the self-hatred, you know, like, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm writing a book right now and I'm having some demons come up. Like, what do I have to say? <laughs> oh my God, I should just stop now. You know, <laughs> horrible. It's a, it's a form of hell, really. Um, and what do I do with that? I could believe it. I could call my publisher and say, forget it. <laughs> Never mind. Here's the deposit back. Or I can turn towards it and learn to love that part of me that feels afraid and, you know, not, not good enough. That's self Tonglen right there. Then we're out of the prison, you know. Suddenly the prison becomes paradise. So who raised their hand and then they disappeared? I was just about to call on you. You want to come back? I believe it was Denise. I, I don't know if I should come back or not, but I'll go ahead and open my mouth up and see what comes out. Okay, good. You'll be the last one and then we'll do the slogan as promised. I just wanted to say that I've been very uh, afraid of all the, the feelings of dictatorship, authoritarianism all around the world, but especially here and for my kids. And then in the fall, when I saw Lama Sultram's exercise of feeding your demons, and I started that, and then Tong Lin came in in a different way, it's really helped hugely because I, I just, when I remember in the moment or not in the moment and push through it, I'm able then to not be immobilized. Um, I'm able yeah. to come from a centered loving place and the energy is totally different. And I was able to do that at times before, but not as much as I needed to. And it's just been a real gift that switch of, um, being present in a loving way and and still active in the world. Anyway, all of it makes me much less of a coward. Yeah, good. Then you become a refuge in the right. You become a refuge. Like in the beginning of our spiritual practice, we're like a little redwood tree sapling, and the animals come and want to gobble it up or eat, nibble on it, and trample on us so there has to be some kind of protection perhaps around it right and then but as it, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger it becomes the place of refuge and shade for those same animals actually so the idea is same for us is on the spiritual path we might need some coddling and care in the beginning some protection some guidance but then as our practice gets stronger we become a place of refuge for people in our family and our life you know, to whatever capacity, you know, whether large or small, you know, modest or big scale, whatever it is. Um, it's all 
a part of the puzzle of making this world a better place. Yeah, good. Thank you for sharing that, Denise. Especially for our kids, you know, if you're a parent, this practice is really helpful. Okay, so where is our slogan here? <laughs> this one. It's it's good. It's good. The, the very last one is great. Um, okay, number 58. Don't be fr frivolous. <laughs> don't be frivolous. Um, another translation is don't be temperamental. That's from Zigar Kongtor Rinpoche. Uh, don't be temperamental. Don't be frivolous. I looked up the Tibetan. So the Tibetan is Yudsam, Yudsampa Mija. Yudsampa Mija. Uh, so Yudsam, Yudsam, when it's paired with the negative, and here it is, Mija means don't do. Mija, don't do. So yudsam literally means like yudsam, I mean, means not even for an instant or a mere fraction, a tiny bit, momentary, for a fleeting instant. And so it's kind of an interesting, it's a, it's a phrase that if you're just a, a you know, English speaker or foreign language that you're trying to translate and out of Tibetan, you'd be like, what are they talking? Like, don't do it even for a minute. <laughs> like, what does that mean? Of course, a native speaker will be able to, to apply this Chogyam Trungpa translated as don't be frivolous, don't be temperamental. But what I get from the Tibetan is like, don't be like um, flippant, you know, uh, have some gravitas, you know, don't be frivolous. Don't be temperamental. That's interesting. So don't be temperamental. So what does that mean? Okay, so why is this the second to the last slogan? <laughs> so the ups and downs that we have in our life all around us, it can be difficult. Here we are again, you know, oh, here I am depressed again. Here I am getting injured again. You know, this, oh, this futility sometimes of the cycle of life. And as with the Tonglen, what we're learning to do is have that kind of gravitas to not be flippant, you know, not be temperamental, but actually like to be able to meet the, the rawness of, the li of life, our emotions, the tragedies, the beauty, meet them and really meet them wholeheartedly with maturity, with courage, like, like you said. And to understand that like, especially our emotions, like the challenging emotions, they're not bad. You know, the anger is not inherently bad. Depression's not inherently bad. These are all signals telling us things. What it is is how are we reacting? You know, how, and we, we've heard this a million times before, most of us, you know, like all of us maybe. But, but it's really more about how we react. We relate to these natural emotions and thoughts that come up in our life. And it's that those reactions, the resistance, the judgment, you know, or the amplification, all of the things, the way we react to the emotions, these natural occurrences that come up are what cause us to suffer sometimes and really also cause other people to suffer, right? So we really need to look inside and work with that, with the Tonglen, with the Feeding Your Demons, with mindfulness, uh, with shamatha, with just self-love and self-compassion, metta and so on. And this kind of capacity is very important in relationships too. You know, if we're temperamental, if we're kind of flippant or what is the Trungpa translation, frivolous, if our relationships meaning, you know, I don't know how you probably could come up with good ways to explain that as well, just as good as I can. But, you know, when we don't take people seriously or when we're flippant or temperamental or frivolous, in our relationships, it can make it hard to connect. And especially if important, difficult conversations need to be had, issues arise in relationship, a child experiences a, a horrible tragedy, you know, or abuse, you know, like if, if we, we need to be able to meet life in its full spectrum. 
So we, people won't feel like they can really relate to us or trust us even, or really want to share with us if we are, you could say shallow, maybe, or temperamental. Um, what's interesting is Zingar Kongtro Rinpoche says, but on the other hand, don't overprocess either. <laughs> you know, we need to strike a balance. Sometimes we can get overly process oriented and then we're always always process i had a friend like that in college it was just always in their process and i i find myself thinking like well where's the fun you know <laughs> like where's the fruit of the processing like let's let's have some fun you know was, i could see that this person it had become a habit to always process so striking a balance you know not being too shallow not being too process oriented this kind of strike a balance be able to move between the two and know when it's time to either you know get serious and listen and take things seriously process or when it's time to have some fun to lighten up to enjoy so in the lojong like we were talking about earlier we're always working we're always focusing on working things out with our internally, you know, in our mind first. Like, why am I reacting that way? Before I go yell at the person, <laughs> you know, what's triggered? Okay, maybe I need to breathe for a little bit. Do some donglen. Donglen on the go. Before I speak or before I act or make that decision. So always working internally first, right? Working with the mind first and then moving from there. Know when it's our time to do the work, like in feeding your demons or therapy, whatever it is. Then come back together, talk to each other. You know, um, in relationship, it's really good to know when you're really triggered and when you're going to dig a grave before you dig the grave, right? Before you go into it. Pause. Let me go work with this. Let me do a feeding your demons session on my own to really find the deeper voice that wants to speak here, the deeper need. Or, you know, when you're in relationship, long-term marriage, these things can be very helpful. And then lastly, um, and then I'd like to open it up to you, all your thoughts about this. Uh, the last thought is that, you know, really when we're more balanced, more even-tempered, less reactive, we're just easier to get along with, you know? We tend to be more calm more balanced within ourselves and with those around us, you know, like natural leaders or, you know, a parent that a, a kid loves and adores and trusts because they feel that, that even tempered, balanced wisdom. This is what we become through as a Lojong and Tonglen practitioners. So that is the slogan. Don't be frivolous. Don't be temperamental. Yitsampa Mija. Yitsampa Mija. So, any comments, questions about that? You know, these final slogans are really like pointers on how to how to live in the world, you know, little pointers, how to be, how to bring the practice off the cushion. Some of them are deep, some of them are more like, you know, things you'd hear from your grandma, <laughs> little life tips. I guess you could also understand this in terms of... Um, you know, like choices we make in our life, like who are we around? You know, what, what work opportunities do we say yes to and no to, you know, like what, what's deep for us? What's meaningful, not just superficial and frivolous. Mm. 
Yeah, really make use of this precious human life. Juliet, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I was wondering, um, you know, I came into this rather late um, uh, in this series. Uh -huh. Do you think um, at some point we'll start over from, you know, slogan one again? Yeah, this is the second time I've done it. Uh -huh. in the last five years or so you know or four years um we'll do it again but you know in the meantime there's some good books if you want you can start okay. reading some books do you like to do you want some book recommendations in the meantime or sure thank you you know the one that's kind of lively and a classic is start where you are by Pema children that one's really accessible and kind of fun to read start where you are okay by Pema children um I've got my Lojong section <laughs> behind me here. Um, one of the more recent books that I like and that I draw from a lot in my teachings, especially this time around, is oh, not this one. Yes, this one's good too. But It's the one by Zegar Kongto Rinpoche. I can't remember what it's called, like Awakened Heart or something. Zegar Kongto, I'll put his name in here. I think it's a good one. Zegar Kongto Rinpoche. Just, just Google him and Lo Jong and you'll find his book about it. The Intelligent Heart. What? The Intelligent Heart. Yeah, The Intelligent us. Heart. Thank yeah. you, that one. Yeah, that's yeah. a good book. Yeah, I've been reading the Lo Jungs before our sits. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's good. Yeah, and then one of my, the first teachings I had extensively on Lo Jung were with my mentor, B. Allen Wallace, and this book called Buddhism with an Attitude is classic, and it's a publication of the lectures I attended in Santa Barbara back in the 90s with him. So I remember, I remember the talks he gave. And then this is the uh, classic, really root text. You know, it's good to study root texts. This is um, The Great Path of Awakening, the classic guide to Lo Jong by Jamgun Kongtrul. Jamgun Kongtrul. Great Path of Awakening. And spell it right. <laughs> um, this one's good, translated by Ken McLeod. It's a classic, Shambhala classic. Very pithy, very traditional. Each of the slogans, um, and then his commentary to them, brief commentaries. I, my ex-husband went on retreat many years ago, and he said, if there's one book you could give me, a Buddhist book, you could give me, what would you give me? I gave him this. And it blew his mind. Like he really practiced it. And it, I, it, I noticed beautiful shifts in, in him through that. It's this tiny book. So Juliet, yeah. Is that you again? You. Yeah, you're welcome. So I mean, you can read those, but then also just know that the book that we're going to start in a couple of weeks is another form of mind training. You'll see some similar themes, but in a totally different way and very different, but, you know, all of Dharma, like I said last time, all of Dharma is a form of mind training. You know, we're always training the mind. And so it has different um, flavors, but this, um, but the essence is the same. Develop compassion, wisdom, you know, decrease negative mental states, increase positive mental states. Well, thank you, everyone. So I'll see you again next week with Eve. And then two weeks from now, we'll be feeding your demons. And then we'll start three weeks. November 3rd, we'll start our next book study group on the path to enlightenment. 
edited by Matthew Ricard, in case you join late. So you can get that if you want to read along with us, but you're not required to if you don't want to. Thank you, everyone. Wishing you well to have a good week and a weekend, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Let's just take a moment to offer up our practice and our study for the welfare of all beings everywhere. This practice is needed more than ever. Deep gratitude. Thank you, everyone. And whatever